car. The second sex speaks. <laughs> My thesis is the following. First, the separation of sex from generation leads to a whole series of other separations, sex from marriage, children from marriage, the child from sex, and even from their own parents, spouses from each other, and man and woman from marriage itself, all predicted by Humani Vitae and others, especially, for example, Elizabeth Anscombe. More fundamentally, though, the first of the separation leads to, as it presupposes, a separation from reality itself, as the Italian philo political philosopher Del Noce said, sexual liberation is not designed per se, but rather as a tool to break down the family because it is the organ through which metaphysical, metahistorical values are communicated through tradition, the handing down not just of the past, but a heritage of truth. For Reich, the sexual revolution was the most comprehensive of revolutions because it was not only against civilization and values, but against the very principle of reality itself. Indeed, he thought that liberation from the notion of a sexual urge in the service of procreation was at the very center of that liberation because it was platonic, finalistic, idealistic, one that presupposes a goal which has a supernatural origin. Initially, Carlo wasn't on the panel, so I dipped into Carlo Del Noche. But we must now add to this an even more radical form of the separation from reality, one which concerns not just the reality of our acts, but what and who we are, a man or woman. Gender, according to its current usage and practice, separates us from ourselves, our identities, from that fundamental fact of our being born, thus from our forebears and with them our creator. In so doing, it attempts to render meaningless all of the givenness that comes from birth. In sum, the separation of the two meanings is the sine qua non of a fragmentation at every point and at the deepest level. Putting asunder what God has joined, it has put us asunder from God himself. Second, we enact these separations to protect ourselves from relations we consider to be alienating or dangerous to us as individuals because they constrict our freedom. It is a question of safety. But do these separations deliver? You may already have an idea about that. Suffice to say, I offer thirdly a wholly different solution to the same concern over power and instrumentalization by turning to the principle at the heart of Humani Vitae, the principle of inseparability. First, a gr grammatical prelude. Let me give, begin by noting something about real gender something about found in the Latin root of the English word and present in other nouns such as genealogy, generation, generosity, and in the verb to engender, to beget. Gender, according to its own root, suggests a series of relations tied to the rhythm of generation with one's forebears, with the past, with the opposite sex, the present, and with one's potential progeny, the future. A brief word on the first of these relations. By the simple fact of being sexual, we are the kind of beings that are brought into existence through the sexual process. We are begotten and born. This fact then ties us to another inexorable fact at the other end of our lives. Being sexual, we find ourselves between the bookends of birth and death. It brings to light, therefore, one of the most basic differences between us and God. We are finite creatures. Sexuality is not simply identical with finitude, of course, since there are organisms that come into being and are quickly replaced by new individuals of their species through asexual reproduction. But what sex the sexual process makes more visible, gradually, is the deeper and positive logic of finitude, namely that we exist by virtue of and for the sake of a co-unity, a unity of two. What is more, in the hierarchy of organisms, the co-unity at the origin of each new individual becomes progressively more both a unity and a duality, to the point that at the highest levels of life, reproduction involves the highest degree of parental unity, extending well beyond conception, taking place inside the body, as parents raise and educate their progeny inside a home, and the highest degree of distinction in their sexual dimorphism and in their care of the young. So much does it need is in need of um, uh, division of labor, and also in their longer life lived with their children. They don't just disappear and are replaced. 
the same direct relation between unity and distinction holds for the progeny itself. As Hans Jonas noted, observing the dialectical nature of organisms in their ascent up the ladder of organic life, namely that as relation to the outside increases, so does the in-itselfness of the individual, where you have greater perception, greater locomotion, greater emotion, capacity to learn, memory, and so on. In some, at the highest level of sexual life, we find communities where members are the most distinct as individuals and the most deeply united with other members. They are persons, that is, individuals, who are at once unique someones with proper names and deeply situated within a field of relations signified by their family names. Indeed, human beings do not simply replace their forebears. Death is not natural for them. They mourn their dead and keep them alive through memory, through intergenerational bonds, even going so far as to hope to see them one day in the flesh. With Christianity, the horizontal communion, this horizontal communion between the generation, generations is fully opened up vertically, so to speak, because the embodied person becomes an ultimate reality within the community of saints. There, the creaturely finitude that sexual difference betokens is taken up in the, into infinitude, the ultimate co-unity, in which we find one who is eternally begotten in whom all finite things were created. Two, gender as separation. Today's gender calls into question the most basic fact, this most basic fact of our being, the fact of our being born. It is in fact set up alongside the term sex to suggest something else. We should not be distracted by the rare disorders of genetic and hormonal kind originating at some point in utero, nor by psychosomatic disorders dysphoria, etc. These are not unimportant nor undramatic. The point is that gender in its current usage does not ultimately require any of this, even if it uses it for purposes of public argument and persuasion, especially in the Catholic world. So used is it to natural law arguments about the way one is born. The idea of gender means to release us precisely from the way we are born, from any pre-existing ground, and open up the way for our own reconception. Judith Butler insists on this when she rejects all metaphysical nouns, being, substance, subject, sex, anything we might call a, a there, a given. Gender for her is a verb or performance, as we know. It makes all of these. She's quite consciously translating at the level of sex Nietzsche's claim that, quote, there is no being behind doing, effecting, becoming. The deed is everything. Gender, then, is the groundless deed performed on ourselves, a sort of creation ex nihilo. It is the ultimate expression of modernity's stalemate between nature and person, where person means indeterminacy, standing over and against nature, which is now dumb. The idea of gender underwent a long incubation period well before it was introduced into the current lexicon with its new definition. It can be traced back to feminism and the homosexual movement, which suggested that all natural, all these three natural relations were social constructs imposed compulsorily on individuals. There, much is made of the nature-nurture distinction, which had become a dualism in modernity, together with that between nature and person. Such that any evidence of development through upbringing and education provided proof that something was imposed on the nature, which for its part had lost its teleological relation to the outside to society, parents, educators, and the other sex. More to the point, the alleged imposition is taken to be the fruit of a nefarious scheme of subjection. It should be noted how vehement is the insistence about gender as a social construct, especially in the face of all the bodily evidence to the contrary. One feminist wrote, patriarchy is so powerful, it has the successful habit of passing itself off as nature. But Judith Butler is the most vehement in her insistence that there is no there there, when she claims that the very appearance of a given nature is itself the effect of a discourse, which is so clever that it makes the alleged nature look original, while really something more original lurks behind it, namely the discourse, which is an operation of power. 
The argument for gender as a mere social construct has thus been thoroughly inoculated against any contrary na naked evidence. In some gender exists to hide any trace of reality lying underneath it, paving the way to make one for ourselves. But gender does not just hide the naked evidence, it actively resists and opposes it through separation. Specifically, it resists the three relations implied in the very word it takes for itself. Historically, the idea of gender as a social construct was aimed at feminism's dominant concern, then and always, the problem of the child for the woman, considered to be at odds with her humanity and an obstacle to her equality with men. The woman, said de Beauvoir, is in the servitude of maternity, which was in itself alienating enough, but which additionally puts her in a state of deep dependence on the father, who is complicit in a grand scheme of alienating the woman as his other. For de Beauvoir, just as the two servitudes went hand in hand, so did the woman's independence from each. To use the language of humane vitae, the suppression of one meaning, unity with child, necessarily required the suppression of the other meaning, unity with man. In the history that ensued, the suppression of the unity between the sexes took the form of either making them interchangeable or setting them apart from one another, it's more European, or finally turning them in a different direction and orientation altogether. In sum, by making the one thing they cannot have without the other optional, gender makes man and woman optional to each other. But since there have to be children for the reproduction of society, gender brings them back on, new, on the new grounds of separation. Gender is a close ally with assisted reproductive technologies which separates children from sex and often one or both of the parents by replacing the sexual act and tending ever more to replace sex itself. I refer to the book End of Sex. Reproduction without sexual unity now frees parents from the reproductive limits, its timing, its heteronormativity, not to mention the old lack of control over results. But it also frees future children from the burden of being born. Politically speaking, they provide the cell for which society has been waiting. New forms of kinship, ones established on the basis of choice, not carnal bonds, emancipated thereby from operations of power. This is all fore foretold by Shulamite Firestone um, back in the 50s. In short, gender is a full circle sundering of woman from child, woman from man, and child from both. It should be noted here that gender only hides and resists the essence of sexual difference. Indeed, many of the features of sexual difference are very apparent and happily masqueraded. But they are now all appearance, no substance, or as Butler says, they are free-floating attributes. This is clear in the extravagant use that gender makes of all the leftover packaging, everything that is actually inessential to sexual difference, even if not immaterial. The much maligned stereotypes such as preference for lipstick and maxi skirts, which now detached as they are from the essence of sexual difference really are stereotypes. A man declares himself to be a woman precisely on account of these things, eclipsing thereby the essential qualification for being one. It is that which is hidden and it is that which is, is opposed. Why do we do this? Two. It is because the essential ingredients of sexual difference bind us to each other in a given order of things prior to our choosing, which involves all kinds of unchosen claims and indebtednesses. In being born, we arrive on the scene caught up in a set of arrangements we didn't sign up for. We find ourselves already facing a certain direction regardless of our proclivities. And our futures are not simply in our own hands or dreams. Turning to the inseparable meanings, it is clear how demanding fruitfulness is on the unity between the sexes. It entails a unity of the greatest kind where the division of labor between the sexes makes them necessary to each other and well beyond the conception and birth of a child. There's also the fact that their openness to the child makes them vulnerable. They are not in control of the child they will have or not. It's clear, too, how demanding the unity of the sexes is on the children, the fruit, who cannot think of themselves as fashioned out of their own ribs, but as heirs in the most basic thing of all, their very existence. In liberal terms, 
These essential ingredients are limitations on our freedom of movement. In sexual revolution terms, they are repressive. In postmodern terms, they are operations of power. All of the above makes them therefore unsafe, not only because of the occasional, even frequent abuse, but by definition. The innate antagonism might be explicit, it may be implicit. In either event, the antagonism in the three natural relations is taken for granted. This is why we call them, we insist that they are not original. Why it is good for us to be alone and not good to be together, a common good. A son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, a mother, and a father. The perception of antagonism is, of course, tied to the dominant conception of freedom, about m which much has, been, much has been said. I would just say that what it, what it combines, though, is not only the, the sort of stalemate between nature and pe person, but also the stalemate between substance and relation, so that both, both, of those, both of those dialectics are going on, both of those inverse relations are going on. At this point, we might ask, is there anything new here? Weariness about the relations in which we are caught up is ancient. We do abuse each other, and we almost always have, as ancient myths attest quite, quite beautifully. Perhaps here we could say that modernity's distinction is to have made the, this abuse the first, last, and most definitive word, describing what is original, not original sin, where it is the truth to think of our fathers as tyrants and not a temptation. Of course, we are referring to the biblical account here, but even the great representatives of the ancient world were capable of glimpsing the distinction between what was natural and pathological with their social, speaking, and political animals. <coughs> Perhaps, though, an even more striking distinction of our age is our attempt to render invisible all the naked evidence of these relations, insofar as they smack of something already there, not merely optional. As Hannah Arendt said of modern ideology, it is the knowledgeable dismissible, it is the knowledgeable dismissal of what is visible. Perhaps this is the ever newness of the ever ancient original sin. Modernity doesn't just push against God, it pushes against the Christian God who created all that is, ex, that all that is ex nihilo, through and for his son, who then gathered it all up incarnately, even all the pagan semina verbi, sown by him in the beginning. There is simply nothing left untouched by Christianity to revert back to, not even paganism. That is why the only other God left is the nothing, the nothing of spontaneous subjectivity. The natural relations, of course, don't just disappear into the void. They, don't, they just don't represent any prevenient natural order. First, they are vehemently declared not to represent any prevenient natural order against all appearance. Then they are declared to be mere options available to the indeterminate will. Then they are put under its control and management in a new contractual arrangement on safer ground. Having a child is a mere choice. Marital unions are merely voluntary and not only as unions now. Even the child's relation to his parents is reconceived as a putative adult with whom the parents are in, negoti in negotiation. And of course, our own relation to our very bodies is now a renegotiable choice. It is in this sense of opposition, uh, and in the sense of opposition, that gender can be said to be diabolical in the deepest sense as that which separates things that belong together, then reattaches them, and on its own terms, reconfiguring them thereby. We can see how much the separation of inseparable things changes those things. They stand and fall together. In view of the reasons why we seek to jettison the three basic natural relations, we might ask whether we have actually succeeded in securing more freedom and greater individuality for ourselves in doing so. Recall that it is because there is always a relation behind every substance, or the appearance of substance, that Butler questions the very idea of an underlying substance. Indeed, Butler puts words like substance, I, or subject between her postmodern scare quotes because they only exist as products and captives of operations of power. There is for her no prediscursive substance, no subject. 
And given her view that the discourse is a relation of power, the only op option for the putative self is to reject it by calling into question the appearance of substance in the form of fluidity, amorphous non-identity. Simone de Beauvoir, in her way, had already gone down this path in her nervous account of biology well before her account of social influences when she suggested a preference for forms of reproduction where there is the least amount of relation, asexual, hermaphroditic, fertilization outside the female body, even though these occurred at the level of biological life where there is the least of all individuality, as in the case of bacteria, protozoa, annelid worms, mollusks, fish, toads, and frogs. We should note that this self-subversive conclusion does not only befall postmodernism, which is upfront about its denial of a prediscursive subject. Liberals like Martha Nussbaum balk at Butler, who denies us any pre-cultural agency, dooming us permanently, therefore, to bondage and hopeless gestures of resistance. Nussbaum champions many of the same causes as Butler, but on radically different grounds, that of the self-determination of the autonomous individual, unbound prior to choice. But here too, however much we hear talk of, a robu of robust subjects charting their own courses, making their own choices, the liberal individual has to abstract himself out of the actual order in which he is already embedded, the one which makes him the actual <coughs> individual he is. In order to be free, that is, he must vigorously resist his very essence. Precisely by virtue of the very kind of self he fancies himself to be, he must oppose himself. This couldn't be more evident than in the attempts we are now making to cancel ourselves out in the busy field of biotechnology, transitioning into something other than what we are. In this case, it is the self-determining autonomous agent that is canceling himself out, but for much the same reasons that the subject has already been, been denied by postmoderns like Butler. Why? Where there is a prior relation, we cannot be. Notwithstanding differences, the self-subversive result is the same. One can see here the traces of the devil's bargain where having the whole world, that is, overcoming the limits of our natural relations, really does come at the cost of our very own soul. It was, this, it was for this reason, observing the ironic fate of the modern and postmodern gender project, which in which, the, the, in which has to sacrifice the agent's very essence, or the agent himself, in order to be free, that John Paul II called safe sex radically unsafe. <clears throat> we have begun to see how the gender product, project, which uh, operates by virtue of the separation of meanings, illustrates the negative side of humani vitae's central claim, that they fall and stand together. Let me now speak directly to the positive side of that claim, paying a special attention to the chief concerns of those in favor of separation, namely freedom, safety, love, individuality. Humani vitae made the case that it's only through openness to the child that conjugal love would be itself. Much could be said about the important developments of the theology of marriage from Casti Canubi to Gaudium at Space that was more capable of showing that procreation was not placed next to love, but included in it, and thus did not instrumentalize love. And of course, Humani Vitae does this explicitly with John Paul II later commenting in his catechesis. I will not say anything more about that. Part of seeing how much, or part of seeing how little the openness to the procreative end instrumentalizes conjugal love is to see how it prevents the instrumentalization of the lovers themselves, conjugal and otherwise. It should be obvious 50 years later how poorly the unity between man and woman has fared under the regime of separation. Naive prophets who promise an improved marital life with more single-minded focus, so to speak, could hardly have imagined the level to which we would have descended, habituated as we are now with our transactional, transactional encounters when they aren't merely virtual. In sum, has not the separation of sex from children not reduced sexual partners to means of purely private ends, to persons trapped within operations of power, the very thing it was meant to prevent? To put it in the terms of the contraception debate, has it not banished love, the very thing it was supposed to foster? But what is it about the openness to procreation that makes conjugal love love? 
to sum it up, it has been beautifully, beautifully spelled out by Adrian Walker, so I will just simply say this. To sum it up, openness to the child is the incarnate expression of everything that love is. Affirmation of the being of the beloved, the desire that he or she flourish, the desire to be with the beloved, the desire that the, that the beloved be forever, forswearing any elimination of the difference through fusion or violence. And Del Noche points out in his book how much Reich's notion of sex, how much the theme of fusion dominates the language of sexual revolution. The point here is that the child is the embodiment of all of this. But let me look at things from the other side of the coin. If the meanings of, of are inseparable, then why is the unity of spouses necessary for procreation to be procreation? One of the obvious ways in which we can see that conjugal love is not instrumentalized by its end is the church's longstanding injunction against any form of procreation which circumvents the conjugal act. Beginning with all, beginning with all the older methods of procuring children which circumvented marriage itself in the event of sterility through divorce, polygamy, and concubinage. Essentially at the heart of the church's opposition to the separation of the procreation from the conjugal act was that the child would become subject to a dominion characteristic of things made, not begotten. Substituting the act of begetting by which natural organisms bear fruit with a technological mode of production establishes the domination of technology over the origin and destiny of the human person. Much has been said about that. We are reminded of Lewis's conditioners who can now cut out their posterity in what shape they please. This is the desire to replace begetting with a more exalted source, I'm quoting Mephistopheles in Goethe's Faust, is an old one, one that can be traced back to the Kabbalistic homunculus, whose name is Gollum, and on whose forehead is written, God is dead. It goes without saying that reproduction of this kind does not generate a world of freedom. The very coming to be in vitro illustrates this. The little specimen is literally hemmed in, circumscribed by his little specific task. All questions arising from the depth of his soul having been stifled. To quote the little man-made man, quote, the universe suffices nature not, what's artificial needs a closed in space. The issue here is not about a kind of action which has do domination as its logic. The issue here is about a kind of action which has domination as its logic. Intentions may be good, but no, ma no matter all the good intentions, parents are inside a logic which contradicts them. The child is now the direct object of their design. He is an object of an operation of power. The church's injunction against this side of the separation is helpful for understanding its injunction against the other side. For here one can see that the child, not being a means to an end, must come from an activity which is not a means to an end, a biological laboratory. The German philosopher Robert Speyman comments, uh, is elucidating and funny when he says, as I was speaking to his own child, don't believe I was thinking of you when I was with your mother. <laughs> The child, of course, can be wanted, but only as the fruit of an act of mutual, gratuitous, uncalculating self-forgetfulness. Here we can see the precise sense in which procreation is the end of the conjugal act, because the fruit is the expression and fullness of the activity itself. We can address here also what is often the most difficult challenge to the teaching of Humani Vitae, namely, that most of the time in the life of a married couple they are infertile, including during their fertile years. Given this, how can the church say that each and every marital act must of necessity retain its intrinsic relation to procreation? As we saw before in the ladder of organic life, the higher the organism, the deeper degree of union there is in the activity of the parents, both in the actual conception of the new individual and in its education. Ada Portman speaks of the child's need for a second uterine year in the womb of the family. Since only in the family does a human child learn to speak, stand, stand upright, and walk. And this need is not only for food and shelter, but for being brought up humanly in a human community. The insistence on the unity of parents as constitutive dimension of procreation thus is simply a recognition of what a child is, a being from, with, and for a communion of persons. 
Any relaxing of the unity of parents, on the contrary, implies a different conception of the child, either as the object of domination or the subject of resistance to the fact of being born. The former is evident in all the myriad ways in which children have been put to the test, literally, in laboratories by the conditioners. The latter has been in view for far longer, beginning with the leniency of liberalism towards divorce. When John Locke approved a divorce on the grounds that the end of marriage was procreation, he was not wrong about the end, so much as that in what the end consisted. Taking the procreation and education of children seriously, thus, means to take seriously the love of parents for each other. The prohibition against the separation of conjugal union from procreation arises thus from within the depths of procreation, just as the inverse is true. For conjugal love. Augustine famously considered a conjugal act that is either not consciously or intentionally procreative to be wrongful, a venial sin. The church did not follow him on this. How though can the church maintain that each and every marital act must of necessity retain its intrinsic relation to procreation without following Augustine in, its practical, in his practical application of the principle? We could understand this by looking at infertility as a feature of the kind of procreation and education that belongs to the human couple. And with respect to the claim that it is often made that the general infertility of the human couple proves that spouses are not only for procreation, it would be better to say that on the contrary they are more deeply for it since their sexuality takes into account the kind of progeny they are apt for conceiving. Children, in other words, need time with their parents to learn from them many things, chiefly about the communion of persons that put them into being, that marks them now, and asks that to be taken up by them in the future. In this sense, the love of spouses for each other is always the primary education, and always, therefore, re retains its intrinsic relation to the procreation of human life, as the church, together with Augustine, insists. In sum, we can see that the inseparability of sex and generation keeps the man and woman and the child from being a means to an end. It keeps sexual union and procreation from becoming an operation of power. This, though, depends upon the more radical inseparability between ourselves and the fact of our being born and generated, without which we will become the objects of our own operation of power, sacrificing our souls in order to be, to be free. Conclusion. Much has to be said about the temptation to this separation and how to address it. Given the postmodern, I will say a few words though. Given the postmodern concern over power and the modern negative conception of relation, it would be important to return to the scholastic notion of ordered power, not renounce power, but reclaim it as ordered according to which creation is the expression ad extra of divine omnipotence, ad intra, which is the omnipotence of generation, as Thomas said. This qualification of divine omnipotence operative in the creation of the world allows us to see better the shape of worldly being, which is at one and the same time, which at one and the same time owes itself whole and entire to divine causality, it is a gift and is a gift to itself with its own in its selfness. It is a gift that is let go with its own metaphysical interiority and integrity. To speak biblically, the world has a filial form. In him we live and move and have our being, for we too are his offspring. Returning to this deeper sense of divine creative causality in its paradigmatic form of generation would be helpful in the context where every relation prior to consent is seen only in terms of mastery, as an operation of power, hiding behind its created handmaiden of nature. When Butler says that substance has not always been there, that it has been constituted by power, she echoes faintly, however distortedly, the radical contingency of things that comes from the Christian doctrine of creation she is opposing. Moreover, when she says that the meaning of things is not simply there to be discovered, that there is a performative discourse which produces that which it names, names and makes at the same time, she once again echoes faintly the doctrine of creation, which says that the world's meaning is endowed. In the beginning was the word. 
but failing to see the true character of the power which creates as an expression of eternal generation and the filial nature of the word through whom the world is created. Butler can only see the meaning in the world as nothing but a mask behind which the nefarious power play to fix things in place is hidden. In short, assuming a heretical idea of creation in both the voluntarist and nominalist sense requires that all meaning, indeed all words, be renounced and put between the scare quotes that litter the pages of every postmodern text. Needless to say, as a defense against the heretical understanding of creation, one must become an agent of the same heretical creation of oneself. One must begin all over again from nothing, starting again, taking nothing for granted, with a sheer act of arbitrary power, only this time remaining in pure flux to keep things open. In sum, a return to the true nature of creation and its metaphysics would address our collective concern over power and allow us to accept the fact of our generation and allow us thereby to be free and to be ourselves. And of course, this would include incarnate witnesses to this logos. We should not fail to notice the unique situation we are in today, namely that Christians are the custodians of realities that are not technically matters of faith. Put negatively, the rejection of what is before our very eyes is the rejection of the one in whom all things were created and whom all things hold together. And those who stand for them are imposing their own religious views. Put positively, there is a deep connection between created realities and the ability to see them and the Christian faith. As Chesterton said, everything will be denied in our time. Everything, and I think this is something really new about our time, that the, 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 our, our battles are not over about, technically about matters of faith, but technically about things that are per se known by reason. It's very interesting. Chesterton said, and I conclude, everything will be denied. Everything will become a creed. It is reasonable, it is reasonable to deny the stones in the street. It will be a religious dogma to assert them. Fires will be kindled to testify that two and two make four. Swords will be drawn to prove that leaves are green in summer. We shall be left defending this huge impossible universe which stares us in the face. We shall be those who have seen and yet believed. <laughs>